Good afternoon. No, I'm going to stay for a while. How about that? <laughs> Freedom. Endowed by our Creator, defined by our Constitution, but defended each and every day by the men and women who proudly wear the uniform of these United States. I want to begin with a simple request. Would any of you here who are serving in the United States Armed Forces or who have served, any of our great veterans, please stand, because you're the ones we talk about freedom, we owe that debt of gratitude to. Thank you. I, I've uh, I got a set of patches I carry in my in my pocket to remind me that even though we don't hear a lot about it in the press these days, I've got a couple units deployed from Wisconsin's National Guard, as I know there are from the Guard and Reserve, as well as active duty military personnel from across this country. I would just ask tonight, as you're here having a great time, make sure you remember in your thoughts and more importantly in your prayers, all of our service members, but particularly those who are still deployed in arms way, because we don't hear enough about it in the media. We need to remember them and those that will continue to be deployed going forward. I, I want to begin by, by thanking, sure, go ahead. I want to begin by thanking Chris Cox, not just for that great introduction, but working with Chris and Wayne and Jim and the board and people like Dave Keen I've known for years, who's got some good Wisconsin roots as well. It's really an honor to work with the NRA, not only in my state, but across the country. And I'm proud of my A-plus ranking as a governor. But I'm, I'm proud of that, even though some on the left might say it's a, it's a scarlet letter. I consider it a badge of honor. And I do it not just for the obvious reasons, I do it because if you think about it, I, I'm proud to stand up for law-abiding citizens and, and your right to possess firearms. I'm proud to stand up for, for the great American traditions that are true in my state and across this country of, of hunting and shooting. But most importantly, I'm proud to stand up for freedom. Because you see, the freedom we're talking about is the freedom that was spelled out by our founders in our nation's constitution. And sadly, I, I look to Washington and I see the occupant of the White House right now who seems to forget that when the president is sworn in, he takes an oath of office to preserve, to protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Well, Mr. President, last time I checked, the Second Amendment is part of that Constitution. We need to send a message that when we have a president who takes the oath to protect, or to, excuse me, to preserve, to protect and defend the Constitution, that's not optional. That's mandatory. You don't get to pick and choose which part of the Constitution you like and which part you don't. We once and for all need a president who's gonna stand up and defend the entire Constitution for all the people of America. Now, like all of you here, that's not something new for us. That didn't just come in my head right now or the last few months or even the last few years. I think like so many of you here, I, I think back to my time when I was honored to first be elected to serve in our state assembly, and I was proud to have an A rating back then. I was proud later to, to move on and become elected as the Milwaukee County Executive, where I welcomed many of you about a decade ago to Milwaukee when the convention was right in our backyard. And by the way, in a few minutes, in a couple speakers, you're going to hear from one of my good friends, the sheriff of Milwaukee County, David Clark, who's doing a pretty good job as well. And I'm proud to continue to stand up for those rights as governor. And sometimes people are confused. They think, well, of course he's going to do that. I've been a member of the NRA for years, and they think that's the reason I'm, I'm standing up for those rights. Or they look at the fact that I'm a hunter, and I love to hunt, whether it be with my with my rifle or my shotgun, or sometimes I use a good Matthews bow that's built just up the way in Sparta, Wisconsin, but I love to hunt. Or sometimes they think it's about the heritage of our state that's, that's really been from one generation to the next about hunting, fishing, and trapping, and all those reasons are important. 
But really, it's ultimately more fundamental than that. It's bigger than that. It's deeper than that. It's about freedom. It's ultimately about freedom. When, when we signed into law concealed carry, after the previous governor had vetoed it three times, it was about freedom. When we signed into law Castle Doctrine, uh, something that had been talked about for years, it was ultimately about freedom because we wanted to give people in our state the right to stand up and protect themselves and their family and their loved ones and their property. It's fundamentally about freedom, and we need more of that in America. And that's what's at risk in this country, not just with this president, but from people like Hillary Clinton and others. And it's not just, it's not just the Second Amendment that's at risk. I mean, think about it. We've got a president who seems to think we grow the economy by growing Washington. Last year alone, we had a report out there that showed that six, six of the top 10 wealthiest counties in America were in and around Washington, D.C. I don't know about you, but I think most of us as Americans, we believe we grow the economy in cities and towns and villages all across this great country, that people create jobs, not the government. We got a president, people like Hillary Clinton, who seem to think that you measure success in government by how many people are dependent on the government. I think we should measure success by just the opposite, by how many people are no longer dependent on the government. We need to measure success for that reason because we understand the true freedom and prosperity do not come from the mighty hand of the government. They come from empowering people to live their own lives and control their own destinies through the dignity that is born of work, of work. <laughs> I got to tell you, as a kid, I grew up, my first job in Delavan, Wisconsin was washing dishes at the Countryside Restaurant. I moved up to the big times not long after that. I got a chance to flip hamburgers at McDonald's. Honest to God truth, I was flipping burgers <clears throat> excuse me, in McDonald's in Delavan about the same time my friend Paul Ryan was about 15, 20 miles down the road flipping hamburgers in Janesville. The only difference is his manager told him he had to work the back flipping hamburgers because he didn't have the interpersonal skills to work the front cash register. <laughs> so, kid Paul about that the next time you see him. But I think about growing up that way in that small town, and I think about my parents. My dad was a small town preacher. My mom was a secretary who raised my brother and I. My grandparents on my mother's side were farmers who didn't have indoor plumbing until my mother went off to junior high school. My dad's dad, my grandpa Walker, was a machinist for nearly 40 years at Barbara Coleman. My parents and my grandparents were probably like many of you here. We didn't inherit fame or fortune from our family. We inherited something more important. The belief that if you work hard and you play by the rules, you can do and be anything you want in America. We need to make sure that dream is alive for everyone in America today. You see, I often laugh when I think about these folks in Washington who think the answer is more government. When I grew up in that small town, I don't ever remember a one of my classmates saying to me, hey, Scott, someday when I grow up, I want to become dependent on the government. Nobody signed my yearbook, good luck becoming dependent on the government, right? That's just not the American dream. And I think over the years, I've been blessed to meet people from all around the world who've come to this country legally to come here to be Americans and to a person, all of them I met who's been successful today, not a one of them have told me that the reason they came to America was to become dependent on the government. No, I wish more of our young people could meet people like this, because to a person, they tell me the reason they came here was because America was one of the last places standing in the world where it didn't matter what class you were born into, didn't matter what your parents did for a living. In America, you could do or be anything you want. The opportunity was equal to all, but the outcome should still be up to each and every one of us. If you don't remember anything else today, remember this. There's a reason why in America we take a day off to celebrate the 4th of July and not the 15th of April, because in America we celebrate our independence from the government, not our dependence on it.
That's right. And finally, I got to tell you, the, the biggest thing, though, that concerns me today isn't just about growth. It isn't just about reform. It's about safety. I call it safety. National security is something you read about on page seven of the paper. Safety is something you feel right here. When I see that video of that Jordanian burned alive in a cage, when I see those Christians from Egypt and elsewhere that are beheaded, that's something you feel. That's something that concerns you not just about yourself, but about your children, about your coworkers, about your neighbors. I'm afraid right now for the future of my children's generation and those to come because we got a president who draws a line in the sand and allows people to cross it. We got a president who calls ISIS the JV squad, Yemen a success story, Iran a place we can do business with, whose former Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, actually gave Russia a reset button. Think about that, a reset button. I don't know about all of you, but in America where my children are going to grow up, I want a commander in chief who will look the American people in the eye and say that radical Islamic terrorism is a threat and we're going to do something about it. We need, we need a leader in this country who will once and for all say that Israel's an ally and start acting like it. And we need a president who will be straight up with the American people and look them in the eye and tell them it's not a matter of if, it's when they try another attempt on American soil. And for the sake of my children and yours, I'm not going to wait. I'm going to take the fight to them before they bring the fight to us. So we have some challenges in this country. But I want to end by telling you this. I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist. Don't only look at, at states across this country, be it Wisconsin or Michigan or Ohio or Florida or others around this, this great country. You look in the last few years what happened when you elected good, common sense, conservative leadership in those states, and those states started to get better. I'm convinced if we put the right leadership in Washington, we can do the same. But I'm, I'm not just convinced because of what's happened in the states over the last few years. I'm convinced because anyone who looks at American history knows it's happened before. It's happened before. Four years ago, not long after I was elected governor, I got a chance to go in September of 2011 to Philadelphia. And as a kid, I loved history. I, I thought of our founders as bigger than life, almost like superheroes. But our family never had a chance to go to Philadelphia. And so I went to this conference in Philadelphia Tonette and I got up early in the morning. We went out with the National Park Service. We went over and saw the Liberty Bell, and then we went inside Independence Hall. If you any of you have ever been to Philadelphia and you've seen that Independence Hall, the area where they were at was not much bigger than this part of the stage right here. And because of my fondness for the founders, I went in expecting to be blown away. As I got in there and looked, as the sun was coming up, I looked at the desk, I looked at the chairs, and it dawned on me. These were ordinary people. Ordinary people who'd done something quite extraordinary. You see, they didn't just risk their political careers. They didn't risk their business ventures. These were patriots who risked their lives for the freedoms we all dear today. The reason I tell you that story this afternoon is simply this. That reminded me in that moment what makes America great, what makes this country exceptional, what makes the United States of America arguably the greatest country in the history of the world has been all throughout our nation's history. In times of crisis, be it economic or fiscal, be it military or spiritual, what has made America amazing has been in those moments of crisis. There have been men and women of courage who've been willing to stand up and think more about the future of their children and their grandchildren than they thought about their own futures. Ladies and gentlemen here today, let this be that moment in history. 
Let this be this time when we can tell future generations we did not back down. We took the call. We did what was required to make America great again. Let us do that together. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America.